Thank you so much for taking some time to talk with it's us. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So you want to be mayor of Austin again. Yeah. Talk to me about why that is. Well, because there's still a lot of good work that needs to be done and a lot of good that can be done. Um, I had a lot of people come to me and, and encourage me and say they wanted me to run for mayor again. Uh, they were looking for somebody that uh, has a record of getting things done. Uh, has a record of focusing on the things that we need to do to have a high quality of life in, in Austin. Um, and so uh, we thought about it and talked about it and decided, you know, let, let's do this. Let's let's try to make the, the kind of difference that public service allows me to do. You know, this is interesting because when you were mayor, uh, previously Austin was at an all at large position. Mm -hmm. We converted to a 10-1 council, which then kind of reset all of the term limits, which is giving you this opportunity to run. Yes, yeah, it's, it's an interesting, yeah, you're right. The timing, timing's everything, right? And, and it really has created that opportunity. Um, you're, you're correct that, that when I was mayor the first time, uh, back from 1997 to 2001, uh, we were, it was, a, it was a seven member council, a mayor and six members of the, the council, but everyone was elected at large. But a lot was a, much the same. Uh, we went, you know, I was mayor when we went through what is arguably the first real big tech boom. And we were, we were having to try to manage the growth. We were dealing with some of the very same issues that we're dealing today, dealing with today. And I really do think that, 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 that we're in the midst of a transition that is very similar to the transition that we successfully navigated uh, 20 years ago. From 97 to 2001, do you feel as though you laid good groundwork through that transition for Austin to get to where it is today? Well, I don't think we would be the focal point of a worldwide information and knowledge economy. I don't think we would be uh, the city that anywhere in the world people mention when they talk about great cities and where those cities, uh, where, how they can be even greater 20 years from now if we hadn't laid a good foundation. For example, when I was first elected mayor, uh, one of the things that, there were only about three places you could live in downtown Austin. And uh, there may have been more, but I don't even, I remember three. And we laid the groundwork for how you could go about creating a great downtown and one that, that attracted people to live in it. We also laid the groundwork on how you go about managing growth um, and, and how you deal with some of the, the different pressures that you have when you have such a rapidly growing city. It's not that Austin just started growing in the last 20 years. Um, we, we laid the groundwork on, on things ranging from uh, homelessness to public safety. So yeah, I feel like we wouldn't be here today um, but for some of the good decisions that got made back then. And I'd say one other thing about that. You know, we're an envy and, and we, we have some challenges. We have some issues that go along with um, being a city like Austin. But you know, most of our challenges that we look at, most of those challenges are a byproduct of really great success. We're not a city like some that's trying to manage decay. Uh, we really are trying to manage success and do that in the right way. Uh, now, there are some it, it, problems that, that really are not related to great success, but the really good news is we get to try to manage those, address them, and fix them from a platform of success. And most cities would be very envious of that opportunity. Yeah. During your time as mayor, what uh, you know, what piece of policy did you put into place that you're most proud of? Oh, most proud, well, there was quite a few. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with the fact that if you look at, uh, I'll use downtown as one example. If you look at downtown, um, when I was elected mayor, we didn't have a performing arts center, and we now have a performing arts center. We doubled the size of the convention center. We didn't have a convention center hotel, and we built the, uh, created the first convention center hotel in downtown. We didn't have a city hall as such. Uh, there was a temporary, so-called temporary council chambers located where the new city hall is that had been bought back in the 70s. And the idea was that at some point there was going to be a new city hall built. Well, we got that started and done. So the whole Second Street Retail District is an area that, that was, um, I mean, it had just old warehouses uh, one warehouse next door to the temporary council chambers had a tree growing up through it. So we got things done in that regard. I would also say that I'm very proud of some of the things that we did um, 
to better the quality of life throughout the city. For example, when I was mayor, uh, working with the council members and, and uh, uh, Gus Garcia in particular, one of the things that we did is we created the East Austin overlay, zoning overlay, which was to specifically address uh, environmental racism in our community where we had residential, a residential neighborhood, but you had industrial zoning throughout that neighborhood. In fact, in some instances, you had residents, single family residents, on a piece of property that was zoned industrial. So we went in and made changes in that regard. Um, and I'm pleased with the fact that we got the airport open. Um, if you'll remember, uh, Miller was closing during that period of time. I had the good fortune of being the mayor that got to fly on the last plane that landed at Miller and the first one that took off at uh, Bergstrom. So I could go on and on with a list of things, but um, it was a successful time. And the key is um, being able to get things done, uh, being able to build coalitions and work with others. I guess I ought to mention one last thing. When I was elected mayor, we had what I would call a de facto um, two-party system. It was environment, versus developers. It was the Save Our Springs Alliance versus the Real Estate Council. It was the Chamber versus the Sierra Club. And I ran saying, we're going to, we're going to become less of a divided city and more of a city that's united. And we were able to do that. And one of the things I'm the most proud of is we did that in part by purchasing land over the aquifer and in the hills so that Austin will always have um, green space that uh, other cities would would die for. Yeah. You know, a lot has changed in that oh, yeah. time. Um, you know, so you, you went to serve as senator representing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the majority, all of Austin, really. And, and things really, really changed here. Um, a lot of challenges, I think, folks here are facing from being priced out to transportation. Um, what would you say is the biggest challenge, though, Austin is facing right now? Well, I think you probably mentioned it. Um, and actually, you probably mentioned one and two. Uh, number one being uh, cost of living and affordability in this community. And number two being um, how do we get around how, how the congestion and, and traffic. Again, both of those things are arguably a result of a place that people want to be, uh, a place that's not managing decay, but a place that... Uh, people love uh, and, and that's why they're here. That's why they stay here and that's uh, why they come here. Both of those issues are, are going to need to be addressed and they're going to need to be addressed with an effort to, to be realistic about how to go about doing it but then actually get some things accomplished in that regard. You know, I want to talk to you then about those two things because I feel as though in, in, my, in my time here, my short time here, my 10 years, we've always been talking about affordability. We've always been talking about the issues with affordability. What needs to happen? Well, first of all, you start with the, the, the understanding or the context, because you're right. That, but that was the case 10 years before you were here. Austin has always been one of those cities uh, that has, you know, the, the, the statistic that people throw out, I need to verify this, but is that every 20 years Austin doubles in size. Well, whether that's an accurate one or not, we know it grows, and it's been growing pretty fast. 20 years ago, uh, I was the mayor that created the Mayor's Challenge Fund so that we could get, we could work with the private sector, in this case, local banks, to get money that we would back up with what we created at that time, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. We would back up loans, low, low, uh, the, the lowest it could be was $2,500 loans, but low interest loans for at-risk housing housing that was affordable but needed to be updated or work be done so that people could continue to live in that affordable housing. We, as I said, we created the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. We created the SMART Housing Program, and S-M-A-R-T stood for something, and to, to create incentives for developers to, to build more housing in the urban core. And we even set aside what we called desired development zones so that we could incentivize housing in the urban core. But we continue to grow, and we continue to have uh, needs and how we're going to, how to address those as we continue to grow. So 
the experience of having dealt with this before, and by the way, in the legislature, um, I filed a number of bills and was successful on some of those, again, geared at how you could create housing in sometimes very, um, uh, very imaginative ways so that we could keep our housing. So this is not something new, but what we need to do is be relentless and feel a sense of urgency and intensity in order to, to meet the demands of the city. Are, is that building, uh, you know, more apartment units? Is that trying to find a place to build more housing? Is that changing lot sizes? What does that look like? Probably all of those things. <laughs> okay. um, and, 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 and seriously, we need to put a whole lot of things out on the table about how we address these. Obviously, we're going to have to make some changes to the land development code so that we can incentivize and make it easier to build types of housing. We need to have more rental units. Uh, Austin's a, 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 a has a lot of, you know, a little more than half is it, people living in, in rental units. And we need, but, but I also think pretty strongly we need to have um, owned units because one of the things that I want to do for the young people in this community is I want to make sure that they can also start creating some wealth and by ownership and that wealth will end up serving them well 20 and 30 years down the road. So we need to talk about that. But we also need, I think, to recognize that Austin needs to move, the government needs to move at a, the same pace as a whole lot that's going on in the community. And that means making sure that we have permits in a timely fashion. Uh, what I've called for is I served on the Texas Sunset Commission for many years, and that was, is a commission that reviews how government works how state agencies are operating. And what I've called for, and what we will do uh, when I'm mayor, is that we put the permitting process through a sunset process. We review it from top to bottom, soup to nuts, and we come out with proposals of how we do best practices so that we do move as fast as, the, as our economy is moving and as fast as people are moving here and so we can meet the need. And, I, and I've got a number of other things I'll mention, but, but one thing I really want to point out is affordability and cost of living in this town isn't just the cost of, of a piece of housing. We need to make sure that we're keeping up with wages um, and for things like workforce development. I'm going to have programs that, that are focused on high school age uh, kids, students, so that when they come out, what I want them to do is I want them to come out with certificates uh, on their way to whether they're going on to college or not so that they can start very uh, good jobs making more money. I also want to think about what we could do in terms of people coming to the city because we want the best and brightest at the city. How can we encourage that to occur? And I'm looking at, don't know that we can do it yet, but I'll just tell you how I'm thinking about things, um, how we might do away with their student debt if they come to the city uh, for a, a portion of, you know, a certain amount each year as long as they're with the city so that we, we get the best and the brightest. Um, and then I'll, I'll mention one last thing, and that is child care. The number two cost right now for a, from affordability standpoint behind housing is child care in this community. The next mayor is going to have to have a focus on that as well. Trust me, I know. <laughs> yes, I that's right. I know you do. <laughs> yeah. I know you do. You know, I want to talk to you, though, also about transportation, Yeah. which is a big issue uh, and has been. And, and I think there have been kind of a uh, there's been a divide, it seems, between, I would say, city of Austin leadership in terms of planning for transportation and, and what I think some people in Austin really want and what they really want to have and how they want to be able to move around the city. Share with us your thoughts on how you address transportation. Well, I'd be interested, in, I'll do that with you, but I'd be interested in where you see the divide. What do you see the divide being? So I think there is, a, I think we can see a divide between the need to like eliminate, for instance, parking, invest more in bike lanes, do things of that nature. We would like to have a robust transportation system. I think there are some holes and some gaps, frankly, in, in what we currently have. And so people drive their cars. This is also Texas. People love their trucks. Yes. They love their cars. They love the, the freedom and the availability to get in a car and go. How do you, 
How do you uh, do you not do you not see that same divide? No, no I, I, now that I understand what you're saying, but but you know in Austin you could have a divide in a whole lot of different ways, true, and that's why I was asking for sure, the question. For sure. um, look, it is for some reason it seems to be a part of Austin's DNA that there's there's a, a pushback on any effort to improve um, our road system uh, and 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 how we go about doing that. Uh, that w that's been going on again. That's not, that's not something new to Austin, um, but it's it's. Uh, in fact, when I ran for mayor the first time, I used to joke that there's this great debate about if you don't build them, meaning roads, they won't come. And I used to joke that I have declared a winner in that debate, and we all lost because we are still suffering from the lack of transportation um, with this kind of growth. Uh, that we, we weren't prepared for. Here's what I think the good news is. Right now, if you do the back of a napkin uh, math, it comes out to be about 20 to $26 billion of uh, money that has been passed by the voters or set aside to deal with transportation. Uh, now, some of that's big chunks of money. Project Connect is a big chunk of that. Uh, the money that we have obtained and that the state has committed, um, and, and I'm proud that I was part of that when I was in the Senate uh, for I-35. And, um, and then a big chunk of money for what we need to do at the airport. And mm -hmm. we have seen recently how we really need to get ahead of, of some issues there. But then you've got a lot of other money. What I think we need to do, again going back to my concept that city government needs to move at a pace that the rest of the community is moving, and that includes with regard to transportation, is get it done, is move on those kinds of things. But do it in a way that we're being totally transparent. And by that transparency, I mean not only here's, here's what's going on, here's where the money is going, but it's also hold us accountable for getting it moving. We told, we told, the government told you you were gonna have these projects, now's the time to get moving on them. So one of the things that I will do is we will report to the community at least twice a year on where we are on transportation projects. That helps keep the urgency there, it keeps the intensity on it, and what I'll do is I'll have a five-year running timeline. The first one, the first one we have where we report to the public will be five years back. Six months later, it'll be another, you know, we'll keep moving along that way. That way, I don't think you can get by doing it just once a year or whenever, whenever there happens to be a, a, a story that somebody wants to do on it. We have to keep focused on that because it is such an important part. And I think that will keep things moving. It will assure that they get done or there ought to be a very, very, very good reason we're not moving forward on that priority. And would you stick with the priorities you think of this bond money that voters have already passed, for instance? I mean, like some of that is sidewalks, some of that is expansions during, you know, during well, on neighborhood first, street. You do have to follow the will of the voters. Right, yeah, of course. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I've always been very strong on that. When the voters have voted on something, you, you even if I, did, if I voted differently or would have voted differently, you know, th th that's what they voted for. So, so yes, you need to do that. But my idea, which just sounds like a reporting idea, but my idea on why you do that, what that does is that allows the community to come to you and say, ah, you know what's missing here? You need to be doing this or you need to be doing that. And you get better input on what we need to meet those needs. You know, this, uh, this overall chance, I'll say, to be mayor again, what does this mean to you, you know, personally after having to deal with so many <laughs> fights for Austin at the legislature? Well, um, I feel very, very fortunate. And, you know, the, the, um, if, I, if I lay it all out there, the first time I ran for mayor, it came after I'd been very sick. Um, you know, I, I, I tease that I'm supposed to be dead a couple of times over because I was diagnosed at a pretty young age with uh, metastatic testicular cancer and overcame that and it gave me uh, a, a freedom. One of the gifts of cancer was that it gave me a freedom to do different things or maybe try different things. 
And one of those was that I ran for public office, which I also tease makes me the only person in America that thinks um, being mayor of Austin is better than chemotherapy. Uh, but, but, you know, I loved it. And I loved being able to serve, and I loved the way the community, even when it didn't always agree, in, endorsed the ideas. I loved being in the Senate. Although I loved being mayor more than I enjoyed being in the Senate, although I, I really did love it, because being mayor allows you to deal with things right in front of you, make immediate differences in people's lives, get a little dirt under your fingers on those kinds of programs and projects. There's more to be done. And I feel, the, and the way people came to me from all political spectrums and all over the city saying, would you consider running for mayor again? This was not in the initial plan was that it was really gratifying and encouraging and allowing me to continue to serve this town that has been so good to me and I love so much. But I also have that same intensity and urgency I had after being sick. It's different now. It's not being sick. Uh, instead, it's two little girls, one that's four and one that's one, uh, Effie and Birdie, my two little granddaughters, I have a really serious sense of intensity and urgency about what we're going to leave for them. Will they love this town as much as I did and do and everybody else does, and that's why we're all here 20 years from now? And, and the young people that are in this town that are at UT and will want to stay like so many others have done, or the young people that have moved here to try to raise a family and make their fortune and they're in their 20s or 30s and they're looking out 20 years from now, what are we going to leave behind? And I think I have some unique experience and some proven experience that will make a difference in that outcome. Yeah, because is Austin headed on the right direction or are we at a point where, you know, a wrong, a wrong move could, could land us? Well, I think we're at a turning point mm -hmm. and, and I think that, um, so much is happening uh, that is good that we need to manage that success. But I also think that, cr that success creates some challenges that we need to, as part of the management, we need to make sure we do right by those. And we need to make sure that we're, we're doing things in an equitable fashion. Uh, one of the things that I supported so strongly when I supported single member districts uh, is that my hope was that that would allow for the success of the town to be enjoyed in a more equitable way because you would have representatives from neighborhood districts and, and uh, communities of interest in those districts that would make a difference in, in the governance structure. So we're at a, there's no question we're at a turning point. The question is whether or not 20 years from now we're going to achieve the potential we have or are we 20 years from now going to be fighting some of the same fights uh, not make, making sure that, that, I mean, maybe not doing as good a job as we ought to be doing on basic services. Are we going to be, are we going to be facing uh, decay because we don't need to be doing that? And are we going to do it in a way where people in this town feel like, all of them feel like, they, they are able to participate in, the, in what ought to be a great American city? The phrase, keeping Austin weird, yeah. very personal to you, I would imagine. Um, you think you know, I'm that weird? No. <laughs> oh, Senator Watson, that's not what I meant. You know what, you know what I mean. You, you did a lot of, in fact, we got to keep, in Austin, keep Austin weird. Um, license plate, because that was that's one of the that, things that, that you that, passed right at the legislature. Yep. So, you know, I got made fun of a lot for passing that piece of legislation. Well, yeah. The people of Austin enjoy it. Uh, um, that's right. You know, is Austin still weird? Is it still that quirky, fun city? Well, I think it is. Um, you know, we had Eeyore's birthday. Thank goodness it's back. Uh, you know, some of the old time stuff is, is, is there. But, but yes, I, I think, but I think it's important that we maintain that. And part of keeping Austin weird, if we use that phrase, the way I've always seen that is that uh, that means keeping Austin open to new people and new ideas. Um, the way I've explained it to people from you know, all over the country and all over the world when they, they know I've been the mayor and the state senator for Austin and they ask about that, um, what I always tell them is ideas, creative thoughts, pretty much 
always are thought of as weird the first time you hear them. You know, in a town that is this creative and, and is willing to experiment the way it is in industry, um, well, sometimes you hear an idea and you say, "Woo, that's weird. But then it becomes something, you know, uh, the, the truth of the matter is if I told my daddy I was going to open a, a grocery store and sell bean sprouts and granola bars, he would have said, well, son, that's weird. But, of course, that's Whole Foods, right? Uh, and we can give other examples. Austin needs to maintain that creative culture. Uh, it needs to work, and that's going to take work. Uh, it's going to take a focus. Uh, but it's, I, I don't think you would see the kind of growth we're seeing and the love for the place if it wasn't maintaining that special essence that is Austin. You know, already you have some uh, competition in this race. We have former, or still current, but not going to going to be former, uh, State Representative Celia Israel. Yep. You have right now a former Mayor Pro Tem Kathy Tovo, who's sitting on the council now, mm -hmm. suggesting she may run as well. What makes you the better candidate? Well, I think I'm not going to I'm not going to get into specificity that that tries to create a, a contrast. Let me just talk about me for a second. I think I come at this with a unique set of experiences. One is I've already been the mayor and uh, had a very successful run as mayor. In addition to that, I was elected to the Texas Senate, which is a pretty intimate governing body where all of the membership is elected from single member districts except for one person elected at large, and that's the presiding officer. So I have the experience, if you will, of being elected from a single member district and understanding the value of having one person elected at large to try to help set the vision for the entire body and the entire community, in this case, the city of Austin, but at the same time, understanding the demands on those elected from single member districts and working to help amplify their needs and, and the needs of their, their constituents and their districts. Um, and I think that makes a world of difference. I've proved that I can be successful uh, in, in a, this leadership role and get things done the way they need to be done. And, um, and I think that's one of the reasons so much of the community has uh, turned to me and asked me to do this. Thank you for your time today. Oh, this has been great. I appreciate you and all your questions.